All right. We'll let uh, the final people entering take their seats. Welcome back. Did you enjoy the labs? Yes? <laughs> Good, I'm glad to hear it. Well, welcome to the Governor Impact Panel. Uh, what we're going to try to do in this conversation, what we're going to do in this conversation, I think in what you heard earlier this morning, you certainly got a sense of the impact that the Board of Governors has in a wider sense. Uh, and what we're going to do now is we're actually going to zoom in and see how the work that you do impacts people's lives. And we have some really fantastic uh, people here with us on stage today, representatives of the donors and of the Dean of Students office and four scholarship recipients. And uh, we're going to get to know all of them and see what difference the scholarship made in their lives. So let me begin by introducing everyone. This is Linda Streit. Linda, <laughs> indeed. Linda is a former lecturer at, Tia, at Tao who's now committed to philanthropic work and to better society, focusing on education, environment, arts, and sport. Uh, Professor Dulik Newman. <laughs> For the last 30 years, Dulik has been a researcher and full professor at the Faculty of Medicine, and since October, she is Tel Aviv University's Dean of Students. Hodaya Levy is a student at the Stanley Steyer School of Health Professions, pursuing a BA degree in nursing. Welcome, Hodaya. David Bodenheim, to my left, is a student at the Buckman Law Faculty, pursuing an LLM degree in commercial law. Next to him is Karen Bastakel, who is a student at the Kohler School of Management, pursuing her MBA. And last but not least is Professor Lihi Adler Abramovich, head of the Laboratory of Bioinspired Materials and Nanotechnology Department of Oral Biology at the Goldschläger School of Dental Medicine, Sackler Faculty of Medicine. <laughs> and I am Mika, the one who just got through Lihi's title. Let's have a round of applause for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Linda, I'd like to start with you. And I want to start by uh, asking you a little bit about who you are and what led you to the work that you do. So it's wonderful to see everybody. I am a third generation TAU governor. And my daughter was going to be with us. She's also a governor, but unfortunately she's sick. So I grew up in a Zionist family. I came on Aliyah in 1978 from London. And every year my parents would come to Tel Aviv University to a different project. And when I was a student at the Department of English and American Studies, uh, I saw how some of the students, they couldn't afford books. Then we, it was before the web. And I sometimes, I'm sorry to say, I broke copyright because we would do photocopying, which wasn't allowed. And, and I saw how difficult it was for them. And one of my friends was in the new Russian Aliyah, and she was washing floors for eight hours a day in order to pay for her fees. So I very quietly arranged to give her a scholarship. We were brought up to be give it back, and that enabled her to be able to study without having to worry where the next penny was coming from. Wonderful, thank you. So Dorit, I'd like to ask you, you've been Dean of Students since last October, and uh, can you tell us what the Office of the Dean of Students does? Sure you've had thing. time to figure it out by now. <laughs> That's true. So uh, we'd like to think of the uh, Office of the Dean as the umbrella providing the students with a tailwind for the success in the university, for their success, also academic success, as well as a personal success and empowerment as uh, citizens. So we provide the uh, scholarships, we provide the uh, help in terms of a uh, psychological uh, help we, in terms of uh, advising uh, regarding to uh, regarding um, uh, study pathways and also career centers and we also uh, empower particular populations that need more empowering thank you so hodaya um, i want to uh, to see can we see the first picture of hodaya the first photo So cute. So are you dressed up as a nurse in this picture? <laughs> no? 
No, it was in the kindergarten. It, it was uh, a party, something. Uh -huh. um, but it's not a nurse, but in the future I will be dressed as a nurse. Uh, yes, <laughs> indeed you will. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the family you come from and where you grew up. So my name is Adaya Levy, Rublin. I got married two months ago. Yay! So I'm Mazel tov. trying to get used to my last name. Um, I'm the seventh child out of nine brothers and sisters um, to a single mom. I'm uh, originally from Petah Tikva, it's uh, next to Tel Aviv. And uh, now we live together in an apartment in Tel Aviv. Um, and you came from an Orthodox family. Yeah, uh, my family, when I was a child, um, my family was very Orthodox. Uh, uh, we gave us a very Orthodox education and in my school, I wouldn't able to go to the university. It's not um, in the in the in the system that Hudayain was in when she was a child. It was not possible to get a bagrut, right? Yeah. So, so you needed to make a diff to make a switch in order to achieve that. Uh, correct. So when I get to high school, I change to less orthodox uh, school, so I c will be able to do the bagrut test. It's like the um, SAT mm -hmm. and. Um, and to go to do national service, it's uh, instead of the army for religious girls. Um, in my uh, national service, I did a project that called Veadarta. It's with early. Uh, we'll people. get to that in a moment. Uh, no, because <laughs> there's an order to it. But I also want to say uh, that you're you're the second in your family to attend university, right? Yeah, my oldest uh, brother um, has uh, came here as a um, learned. Um, engineering. He's the first in the family and the only one that have a degree. Mm -hmm. And I'm the second one. Um, thanks to the Kanat, I'm <laughs> able to be here as a student also. And I hope to finish my studying and become a nurse and have also a degree in, in, as a nurse. Wonderful. And we're going to hear more about your dreams in a little bit. Can we see? Yes, indeed. Can we see David's first photo, please? All right, so we're looking at the photo in the middle. There you go. So tell us uh, how old you are and who the gentleman in the picture is with you. Um, in this picture, um, I think I'm, th yeah, I'm 13. Okay. Um, the gentleman uh, standing next to me, um, his name is Avram Fried. He's a very famous uh, singer in the Jewish world. Um, there was a purpose for choosing uh, this picture. There was a purpose for uh, choosing this picture. Um, First of all, um, when, when I grew up, I came, I, I grew up in a family of, uh, of eight. My parents didn't have uh, uh, too much money uh, to send me to extra, uh, extra um, cur curriculums out of, uh, out of school. Um, so I uh, urged my uh, brother-in-law, who had uh, passed in the music world, um, I urged him to, uh, to open up a choir. Um, and uh, eventually it worked. He opened a, uh, he opened a choir. Uh, which ended up being very suc successful uh, throughout the year, uh, throughout the years. Um, basically, that that picture to me symbolizes uh, personally um, having a certain goal, um, and then s seeing that um, personal goal have an impact on other people as well. Um, I knew, um, f first of all, it brought me as a little kid sort of to uh, perform in a choir in the top uh, with the top singers in uh, the Jewish world. Um, but also that choir helped out a lot of kids uh, throughout the line, uh, the, down the line, uh, helped a lot of kids um, gain confidence uh, talking uh, to the public and basically gave a, a great, uh, uh, I would say, home for a lot of kids who eventually turned out to be very successful. Right. I thought was that. So it just shows how... And now how David will sing for us. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but we, we might ask you to do that later. You never know. I you never pray. know. Okay. Uh, Karen, can we see Karen's first picture, please? Yes, indeed. Okay. So Karen, tell me, uh, who, who are we looking at in this picture? Oh, this is actually... Can we see Karen's... Uh, let's go back to her gallery. Let's go back to her gallery. Okay. So um, we're looking at that picture. Can you see this one right over here, over my right shoulder? This is Karen with her parents, yes. right? So tell us about your parents. Exactly. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, these are my parents. This photo was taken uh, on my uh, ceremony after, the after I received my bachelorate degree in, in law school. 
in Haifa University. Um, my parents were always the major influence for me. Uh, they always supported me. Originally, I'm from a small town um, up north in Kiryat Shmona, near the Lebanese border. And, uh, after and your parents are originally not from here. Yes, my parents immigrated from India uh, when they were teenagers. And, and they met went, here. And they're Isn't that here. great? Immigrated from Bombay and met, met, met in Kiryat Shmona. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and ever since we were kids, they weren't <laughs> able to support us um, financially to, to get everything, and they weren't able to get their degree, so they pushed us to do whatever we want and pushed us to, to accomplish what we want. Uh, even we also didn't have an encyclopedia, and my parents bought an encyclopedia and pushed us. And, this is back when there were encyclopedias, you know. <laughs> yeah, back then. <laughs> back then it was something uh, uncommon to have an, uh, a computer at home. Mm -hmm. But my parents knew that even if they didn't have it as their, uh, when they were kids, we will have it. And, they and as part of their belief in giving, your father was in the army for a long time. Tell, yes. him, tell him what he used to <laughs> say about you guys when you were kids. My father was a, is an army veteran. He was served in the army for uh, 25 years. And after I was, <laughs> yeah. yes. And when I joined the army, I had to do something at least close. I was for five, year, five years. Yeah. Um, what did your dad say about you kids when you were little? <laughs> he said they were born with a military tag. Yes, yes. We, all bo we, we always were uh, influenced by the army. My father, again, served 25 years. He knew that we must do something meaningful. We must do something more than just be in the army, more than just study. We have to push ourselves. And the army supported him, and this is why he pushed us to do something more than just join the army, than to be a captain, to be an officer in the army, to do much more than just the obvious things that we can do. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, this is Lihi. You saw a video of some of her work in the lab in the, during the earlier panel, the president's presentation. And let's uh, let's see Lihi's first photo. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do we have a Do we have another photo? For, there we go. Okay. What are we seeing in this photo? Okay, so here we can see, actually it's not the photo that we choose, it is, um, but it's similar. So this is my group, actually a few years ago, and this is my research group in the School of Dental Medicine, and, and I'm very proud of, of, of my group. So these are my master's students, PhD, and postdocs, and research associate. And if we're talking about scholarships, so I think that my scholarship, when I was a PhD uh, student, really brought me uh, to this achievement, and this is one of the achievements that I'm very uh, proud of, um, having my own research group. Mm -hmm. And when I was a PhD student, I received the Colden um, Scholarship. This mm -hmm. is a scholarship for uh, excellent PhD students. Uh, it is a very competitive scholarship, and I was honored uh, to receive it uh, during my uh, PhD. 15 years ago, so just so you yeah. understand, the impact is not a short-term issue, obviously. Impact goes on for many, many years. So you got this scholarship 15 years ago, and I believe the Coltons are here. Are they? Yeah, hi. The Colton family? Hi, Judy and Stuart. Thank you. Yeah, so it's great to have you here. Um, and we saw your video, but can you, you know, very briefly summarize what you do, just yeah. in a sentence so or two. I'm the head of the lab of bioinspired materials and nanotechnology. Uh, and in my lab, we actually look at natural materials and we try to mimic them. So we look at the protein and the polysaccharides and the cells that we have in the body. And we try to understand how they work and how to behave. And then in the lab, we artificially mimic these materials. And we are doing this in order to uh, use them for tissue regeneration. So one of the projects that we are very interested in is bone regeneration. So we are looking at how bone can heal in young children when they have fractures and how bone can heal when you have a small uh, loss of bone and we're trying to implant it and to uh, apply it on larger bone defect. Mm -hmm. uh, and this way we can design new materials that can help tissue regeneration in general and specifically in bone tissue. 
Wonderful, thank you. I thought tissue regeneration was when my kids have a cold and I use the same one again and again. Uh, so glad to be educated. Can we see uh, Leahy's uh, picture from her PhD graduation? I just want to say, Leahy, that you turned out to be an excellent investment because like Linda, who is sitting here at my right, you began as a student and you became faculty, right? And a lot of this has to do with your studies at, at, at Tel Aviv University and the fact that you got the scholarship that enabled you to devote yourself to your PhD. Yeah, so during my PhD as just a recipient... Hold your mic as close so to your So during my there PhD as a recipient of the um, uh, Colton Scholarship, I could really dedicate all my time and efforts for the training that I did. So here you can see the image of me in my graduation with my parents. Um, so we, so I, I could invest all my efforts into the research and, and definitely this is a great and important milestone um, to be an independent uh, researcher and in 2015 so I got a position in the School of Dental Medicine and uh, established my uh, independent research group. Wonderful. Linda, you've had some very powerful experience from the giving side. Can you share some of those <coughs> stories with us? Okay, I'll start off with the, um, I, I had a son and he died in a car crash and he would have been in business management. So I started off uh, thinking that I want to give a scholarship and I was connected very much with the um, School of Management and gave to MA students. And then after that, it was the idea of reversing the brain drain that many of our top professors were leaving the country. And uh, Moshe Svan said to me, why don't you see if you can bring them back? And, we, and the scholarships I gave then was to bring back um, young faculty with their young children. But from mm -hmm. the personal point of view, um, <clears throat> when we opened the, the Porter School of uh, the Environment, my family's flagship uh, project, my friend from high school came and she was so uh, overcome, she said, I want to give a scholarship. This is Sarah uh, Summers. Yes, um, her name is Sarah Summers. Now Sarah um, also wanted to give some, uh, she gave a scholarship to the school and then after that, she wanted to give a scholarship in memory of her mother, who was a pianist. So she gave to the music school. And I remember when we were over in the, the, uh, the Senate building, the round building, where we used to be, and Sarah came in through one door, and her, the recipient of her scholarship came in through the other, and he was holding a box of chocolates. And as he gave it to Sarah, the two of them stood in the middle of the hall and burst into tears. It was an amazing moment. It, it really was. So... That's one of the things. And the other thing is the other night, um, my husband, Elliot, and I were having dinner with Richard and Deb. I can't see them, but they're here. Richard, Sincere, and Deb. And Richard said to me, you know, I was born into a wealthy family, but then we lost it all. And I couldn't, I was in Wisconsin, right? And I couldn't afford my studies. And my professor said, well, I have a colleague at Tel Aviv University. Maybe you can get a scholarship there. And so Richard came. And he studied here, and he got his first scholarship here. And then, as the years went by, here he is. He was chairman of AFTA, and he's a great <laughs> investor and businessman. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, that's a hell of a last name. I mean, Richard Sincere, like, you know, it's very limiting professionally. You know, you can't be a lawyer, you can't be a politician, you can't play professional poker. I mean, what are you left with? What's that? It was, I was, I was going to say the etymology, I mean, one of your ancestors must have been so sincere that people were like, we just got to call this dude Mr. Sincere, right? <laughs> uh, Hodaya, can we see Hodaya's second photo? So tell us about this lovely lady that you're with, Hodaya. Her name is uh, Rachel Targian. She is from Jerusalem, uh, the city that I did the national service. Um, so my national service is called the uh, Vehadarta. Um, Which is short from Vehadarta Pnei Zaken. You're familiar with this, right? And it's from the Bible. Um, right. I, I, basically, what I did is to be a friend of elderly people that, um, that are lonely and to give, to give them a company um, and uh, I had uh, eight uh, women like her, and I still have eight a, women. Amazing. Ha, I still have a contact with them, and and my uh, principal in in the national service uh, told them that I'm getting married, and one of them just called me and was so excited for me, 
and it was four years ago, and I feel like they are my grandmothers, and I, I was very um, excited to do this national service. I did two years, mm -hmm. and I... Well, they were very, very lucky to have you. Tell us about receiving your scholarship. You can so start when you were 21, and you wanted to go to school but couldn't afford it. Um, after the national service, I wanted to start studying uh, like the rest of the um, friends of mine. And I wasn't able to pay for the studying. I didn't know how I'm going to pay how the rent and the bills and also uh, to be a student um, together with the studying. Uh, so I started looking for scholarships. I, um, I talked with the decanate here. I didn't know there is such a thing uh, that can help students like me. Um, I talked with Lena, and they uh, contacted me, me uh, with the uh, Tammy scholarship. Um, this is, by the way, after Hodaya worked for five years saving up money for her studies. So she yes. wasn't counting on anyone but herself. Correct. I was independent from a young age. And uh, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress in uh, Jerusalem. Um, it Where very she met difficult. her husband. Yeah. <laughs> I met my husband, and his name is Ruben, and uh, it was very difficult to be, uh, to work for the bills and to save money, and uh, when I met my husband, uh, it was in the corona, and it was the, a break from work. I was always working double shifts, and I didn't know uh, a time that I, I, can't, I couldn't be able to take a break from work, because this is the money that I need for the payment for dentist for everything so the corona came and the restaurant was closed so it was the first step for me to start studying and my husband um, helped me push me uh, to start uh, to be a student here <laughs> and then you went to the decanat for help and you met lena you yeah. told her your story lena i hope she's here <laughs> i can see anything oh, are you here? Oh, yeah. and there she is hi lena i'm very happy that i met her um, so um, I looked for a different scholarship. I didn't. I was not suitable for uh, the scholarship I, that I looked for. And I started studying, and I didn't know how I'm going to pay for the study. I sat in class and I looked at everybody, and I thought that maybe I need to stop studying because I I tried to look for a scholarship, but I didn't find. So I, I looked in Google and I saw the decanat. Um, I emailed Lena. And she's an amazing woman. Every, every time I talked to her, I felt like a um, spark of belief that I can be here. I can be a student. And when she gave me the interview with the Tammy scholarship, I felt like um, I won the lottery. Even though that I didn't get that, I just hear them that people like them want to help us to just to hear me. And they decide if they want to give me or not. I, I'm so happy that I met them. In the interview, it was in Zoom, unfortunately, <laughs> but it was so amazing. And they gave me the scholarship eventually, mm -hmm. and I'm here now. And when we spoke, Hodaya told me that she walked out of that room feeling that they really believe in you and your success and your future. Yeah, I was yeah. sitting in a class here in the library. It was in the Zoom, so I was alone. I was so emotional after the interview. I sat there in like 10 minutes and thinking about all everything that it's <laughs> all my life is dependent on that <laughs> yeah. and I'm so grateful for the interview even though that I didn't know that they're going to give me they just just said just to they, be heard yeah and yeah. they know that they, they believe me in my studies and in the future that I will be succeeded I'm sure you will we're gonna make a great nurse <laughs> David, tell us about your decision to go to law school and about what was going on in your life at the time. Um, I don't know if you well, saw. Oh, did you bring I, oh. it up? Ah, oh, too soon, too soon. Okay, is this to die for or what? Yeah. They don't like. They don't. They don't look like that anymore. <laughs> they're big and they're intimidating. So, <laughs> this happened before he decided to go to law school. Uh, yeah. Oh, with it's the matching after. onesies and everything. <laughs> After uh, being married to my wife for uh, for three years, um, we had uh, we had triplets, uh, two boys and a girl. <laughs> um, basically, the second they were born, 
I always had uh, the urge. I always wanted to go to law school. I always had, uh, I always had to, I always wanted to do it. I had the uh, the feeling that that's what I uh, enjoyed to do, and that's what I want to do. Um, and uh, before uh, uh, before the birth of my children, I worked in a full time job uh, in real estate um, for a couple of years. Uh, it was a good job. Um, and then the, at the sec. Once they were born, I turned to my wife and said, if I don't go to law school now, it's never going to happen. <laughs> um, so I went to, I started my studies uh, while working full time. I uh, went to law school at night. I went to a, a college uh, in Yerushalayim, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and then uh, after finishing uh, uh, law school, I had to uh, make the decision um, either to leave, uh, uh, to leave, to continue doing what I was doing in uh, real estate um, or uh, basically changing, uh, cha mo taking my life a different way um, towards uh, the law field. Um, and I decided that um, that's what I want to do. Um, so I signed up uh, uh, at uh, two firms um, basically to get accepted uh, to, uh, to do an internship before you can do the bar in Israel, you have to do uh, the internship. Mm -hmm. um, I signed up uh, to two firms, and uh, I thank God I got accepted to a Herzog, uh, Herzog Fox Nehman. Uh, Which uh, you may have heard of. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure you've heard of it, yeah. So um, uh, basically at that point, I um, got to the conclusion that I have to stand out. Um, and in order for standing out, um, I always had uh, the urge to continue um, uh, exploring the legal field. Um, on one hand, the practice, uh, which I would do uh, during, uh, um, during my internship and later on uh, uh, working. Um, and also, I, I always wanted to explore the academic side of things. And then a, fr um, a friend at, yeah, Hil at so Hiltzog I, told right, you about... So I had a friend who also interned uh, in Herzog, and he uh, basically um, suggested I go to, uh, to, tell, to TAU. Um, I told him I don't really have... I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm leaving my job. I'm starting a new job, interning, not making too much money. Meanwhile, um, they had a fourth kid. Meanwhile, yeah, um, supporting uh, three kids at home, and uh, we had another little guy who joined us a year ago um, during my internship. Um, and um, he told me, uh, he, he said, listen, I, I went to TAU, um, maybe try and check that out. And then I told him, I don't really have money. Um, he said, uh, listen, you could, uh, you could apply for a scholarship. Um, once I heard that, I said, uh, that's the place I'm going. Um, I don't think there are too many places which uh, support um, uh, students uh, throughout their master's degrees. Um, and I, I could say for a fact that the reason I went to TAU and not to anywhere else was because of that. And obviously, it's an excellent place. Um, mm -hmm. I've been here um, uh, I'm, uh, towards the end of my second uh, year, hopefully going to finish up soon. Um, I met amazing people, um, and it, it helped me a lot personally um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, exploring uh, the legal field, and hopefully uh, my goal is to continue, uh, complete my thesis. Currently, I'm doing it without a thesis. Uh, hopefully, I'll complete that, and then uh, go towards my PhD, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully be a partner in her talk one I day. Can I just say, you, mean, you, you deserve a donor. A, you deserve a school, and a donor, there a you donor. go. <laughs> I know it, it, makes, it, makes a big, it makes a big difference, um, and it made a huge difference in my life, yeah. um, knowing that I don't have the worry of, uh, of needing to pay tuition uh, the next month. And as me, I always felt as a small person in the world and being uh, able to get a scholarship um, that would definitely help me through school was an amazing feeling. And hopefully I'll be able to give that on uh, throughout the years. Can I just say, I mean, you deserve a scholarship. Your wife deserves a Nobel Prize. Big time. <laughs> okay, let's Big just time. put that out there too. So <laughs> let's have a round for David's wife, <laughs> indeed. Karen, what kind of a difference did getting the scholarship make in your life? Um, Just hold the mic close to your mouth, um, even closer. For me, um, when I started my, uh, my degree in here, I, um, it was during COVID, and unfortunately I lost my job. But I, I wasn't able to, to support myself anymore. I, I, I don't have a job, I need to pay tuition, and for me, quitting was not an option. It was out of the, out of the, voca the vocabulary. I cannot think about it, so I try to and apply to a scholarship. And thankfully, I received uh, both in my first and my second year uh, in school. And it helped me so much that I can, I can think about school and not about 
uh, how I pay uh, Not about my making money. ends meet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you give back, too. You may, yes. Uh, while you're a student, you also uh, well, do a lot of volunteer work. Exactly. Uh, during my first degree and now I volunteer. Uh, even I also work in a law firm in Chibolet. Uh, we do pro bono cases and uh, during my studies I support, uh, I, work, I volunteered in Ilan. It's a non-profit organization for handicapped children and adults, uh, both in Haifa and still support them. Uh, we also, I also work with older people uh, during my studies and for me, I know that people gave me uh, the hope and the help that I needed during COVID, which, which was such an amazing uh, opportunity for me. And now I can give back and I can help others with my studies, with what I do. And I, I don't think I could uh, con continue my degree without a scholarship. So it mm -hmm. helped, it, it was brought to me like, <laughs> like Very miracle. significant. Thank you. So, Dorit, we're looking at, at four wonderful uh, academics who have received scholarships. How many apply for scholarships and how many get them and how many don't get them? So, approximately 60% of those who apply for the scholarships get them. We have several thousands that uh, apply for and only several, about half of them are being funded, mm -hmm. but we do have I'm gonna, scholarships. I'm going to quote Anita and say that's, in one word, good, and in two words, not good. <laughs> right, <laughs> but what I do want to say is that there are different levels of scholarships. One, we, we provide scholarships for a tuition, which covers up to 50% of the tuition. Of course, we would like to be able to cover more, and for more people who apply for these scholarships. And those are relatively, I mean, we're talking about, let's say, in general, something like $2,500 for one scholarship for one student. So that's wonderful. Think about every student that mm -hmm. one can um, support. And then that there way. are fellowships and that are And then there are rare. bigger fellowships that can actually provide both tuition and the, such as the one that the Odaya is getting that provides her a tuition as well as a funds for a, for living, for actual living. It's also important to keep in mind that Israeli students are often older than their counterparts right. in other and countries as you see, because of military service. Some of them service. have families yeah. and they, they're after the They army. need a budget that goes beyond pizza and beer is what we're saying, <laughs> right? Diapers. Uh, Diapers. Diapers yeah. and wait, you know, yeah. schooling and the after school activities. And yeah. anyway, the, is the, the uh, conventional Israeli student is older than the college student in the US, for example, and also with families. And, uh, and, we can't, and there is a very wide, wide scale of uh, students in terms of their need for support. And if you think about it, every student needs support in all kinds of fashions if it's a uh, mental support, if it's uh, advice in uh, what career path to take. And uh, we also have all kinds of uh, programs in the, in the decanat, in the dean, uh, dean's office uh, for academic courses that involve uh, social uh, involvement, mm -hmm. which is wonderful because it also empowers the students as uh, citizens. And those programs also require funding for those mentors that follow uh, the programs. Mm -hmm. So there's really a wide range of uh, opportunities to provide for fellowships for students and empower them. Go ahead. I, I just want to say that um, I'm happy to announce that I myself will be giving a master scholarship and a PhD scholarship. Yay, you heard it here first. <laughs> and, and I'm right now working with the university about what I want it to be because the areas that I'm uh, interested in are the arts, can be art, literature, architecture, any of the arts, and anything to do with sports because my late son was a rower and so sport very much interests me. So if there is a high performance athlete out there who needs help getting a PhD, the university needs to tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, uh, Linda, that I'm, I'm a writer. That's my profession. And when people ask me why I went into writing, I always explain that I'm just very greedy. So I went where the money is. 
you know. <laughs> um, but I think oftentimes, and we're going to, I want to hear about your dreams, but I think oftentimes what happens with people who have these kind of talents and ambitions is that they make, you know, they, the entire way and they reach a door, and then it's like the door doesn't have a knob on it, you know. And I think one of the things that you do is, is put a knob on that door and still these talented young people have to turn the knob and open the door and enter the room and get the work done. But without that, you can't even begin. So it's, it's and really important. What I Go just ahead. want to add on to what Linda was saying and Miko was saying is that uh, there's really many, many, uh, a wide array of ways to, uh, to excel our students and a wide array of opportunities to donate for that in all kinds of fellowships, starting from the $2,500 scholarship for helping intuition and all the way to the large funds. Mm -hmm. so. so what this is about is, uh, is about making dreams come true at the end of the day. So Hudaya, tell us what your dream future looks like. Um, so my dream is to be a nurse in ER. I want to specialize uh, as a nurse, uh, I believe in professionalism. Um, I want to uh, be an ER nurse in children's hospital, right? In children's yeah, medicine. Yeah, correct. Uh, I was with elderly people in my national service. I want to contribute also to the young uh, children. <laughs> um, I want to be the best nurse. I think it sounds cliche, but I want to be the, nurse, the best nurse that you ever met. Um, Not a cliche at all. That's a fabulous ambition. I, I'm, I'm 26. I, I started studying maybe late. Um, I have a very young student in my um, class, but I still believe that I can do it. Um, I love my, my profession that I chose. I have the good qualities for that. And I want to be proud of my job, to be proud of what I do, to go every day and to help people. Um, when you get to the hospital, it's not so a um, happy place sometimes, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be able to help them, to make them feel a little bit better. And I really hope that I have that, and I believe that I, ha I have that. Um, I want to get there. I want to be a very successful nurse to my children in the future, to be um, proud of me, to be able to give them what I want to, um, whatever they want, and to be able to, to support the, the people around me. Great. We believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I don't know if you saw, there's a, a show by Ricky Gervais called uh, Afterlife. It's a wonderful show about a man dealing with the death of his wife. And at some point, he complains that there are no angels. He's talking to someone. And she corrects him, and she says, they, there are angels. You met them every day in the hospital wearing their nurse's uniform. And I thought that was a great definition for that profession. Um, David, what's your dream future? Um... As I mentioned, um, completing my thesis um, and going on uh, to complete my PhD at uh, Tel Aviv University. Um, I had, uh, I always have uh, f friends who ask me, why don't you just go do, uh, you know, you have English as your mother tongue, why don't you just do it in the States or anywhere else around the world? Um, so I said, why do I need to go out to the States? There are amazing places right over here. Um, so mainly for Zionistic reasons, I believe in this country. Um, I believe in this, uh, in this school. Um, I've met uh, amazing people, uh, amazing uh, lecturers, amazing professors. Um, some of them I was able, even though we had uh, Corona, which, is in, which wasn't that easy, uh, I was able to also establish like a, per a personal connection with them, uh, with uh, a few of them. Um, yeah, and hopefully uh, being able to give back, uh, uh, to give back uh, and make a small uh, difference in the world. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you, David. Karen, how about you? What's your dream future? Um, for me, I think that my dream future is to make an impact. Um, I'm not sure, especially nowadays, we, we don't know what will happen the next day, but for me, I think that through all, throughout all my life, I wanted to, to do something that means for other people, whether it's in, in volunteering. I still uh, volunteer in Miluim. I think that it brings you something, a, a purpose for your life that is much more than any other job that you get. And I think that if I can impact a small kid that just like me don't, don't know how to, what he's going to do next day and how he, he's going to, come to accomplish his degree and 
I will make an impact and he will do the same way, the, the same path that I did and uh, fought all the difficulties he can get but succeeded anyway, then I think that's... You want to be a role model. Yes. Indeed, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> can, we see, uh, can we see Leahy's third photo, please? So, um, I want to hear about your dreams too, but the photo that we're looking at is, uh, is I think, a dream come true for you already. So tell us about these two young people in the yeah, photo. So uh, this is uh, Dana Conjurassi and you have Dan, two of my PhD <laughs> students. So Dana is here in the back, say hi. Um, and so I told you that 15 years ago, I received the Colton Scholarship and I was really honored last year to uh, get to know that uh, Yoav and Dana, both of my PhD students, received the scholarship uh, this year. Um, so I was really proud. Congratulations, Dana, on the, on the scholarship. Um, so, so I don't know if you asked me about my, my, my dream, but actually, yeah. Of course yeah, I'm but, asking you about yeah, your but, dream. But, yeah, but, um, so I think that what I would like to do is, you know, and, and I relate to what you said, is, is to make an impact. And actually that the research that we do in the lab will influence and, and could really, um, we can get the materials that we are designing and developing into the clinics. Uh, but this is only half of my dream. I think that the, the, sec the, the second part of it is actually the education of the new students. So uh, the, the amazing group that I have and, and, uh, and the knowledge that they get gain during uh, their studies, I think this is, um, um, this is something I'm very proud of. It's wonderful. This is the cycle, the cycle of the scholarships and how significant they are over time. Lloyd, uh, let me ask you, what is your dream for the Dekanat? If you had all the resources, all the resources you could possibly hope for, what would the Office of the Dean of Students do? So, first of all, I think that uh, we would like the students to see the Dekanat or the Dean's Office as the heart of their home in the university. And we would like to be there to provide them all the possible support for their academic life and for them as a, in the holistic, in the holistic sense. That mm -hmm. would be our really ultimate dream. And our, another ultimate dream for the Dekanat would be to really impact all of the students at the university, not just, a, let's say, particular populations that we can provide with a particular scholarships or particular group because all the students really need support, and I think that uh, we at the Decanat can be their uh, home for that. Wonderful. <laughs> Linda, are, are there other important things that you think people should remember about giving scholarships and what they mean to the, both to the giver and the receiver? There's an amazing book, I've forgotten the author, but the, it's called The Joy of Giving. And when you give a scholarship, you can watch somebody blossom. And if you think that you can give them an opportunity, my whole journey of being a donor actually started on a raft in Corfu. When I was there on holiday with my daughter, she was then 16 with her friend, and I was sitting on this raft talking to these two 16-year-olds, and her friend had all these wonderful ideas, but she came from a home where there wasn't one book. She came from a home where they didn't understand about higher education, they couldn't afford anything. And she gave me the idea that if I can help her, what will happen? And so again, I do it very quietly. I did it behind the scenes. She got her degree. She became, she's a fully qualified therapist. She's very, very successful. And her own daughter has just gone into Oxford University. Now that's mm -hmm. what I call success. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> And so, so giving, you give something, but you yourself get something back. And my grandparents taught, taught us very much that you, if you have something and you, you're lucky enough to have it, you need to give back, but in a good way. I don't sort of go around, I want to be patted on my shoulder. For me to see somebody to get, a, our students who get a good, C, a good uh, scholarship, they can put it on their CV. And then when, say, an employer is looking at it, mm -hmm. he'll say, this student is very good. I'm going to take that student that's got a good TAU uh, grant. And so we help them on their way and we help them become better citizens. That's the best I can do. Indeed. So, can um, I just say one you, more you thing? You may, absolutely, please <laughs> so do. So I, I really would like to uh, mention that we see the, the scholarships and the 
the financing, uh, not, we see you not only as outside financers, but really as partners for our journey together. And it's very, very meaningful for us. And we're very excited to share with you the success of our students and uh, their journey as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, indeed. Um, I can tell you that I've always told my kids that uh, giving and receiving are one and the same. And I, I emphasize that they're not two halves of a whole. They don't complete one another. And the example that I always use is when you, give, when you get a gift for someone that you know they're going to love. And at that moment of handing the gift and they, they tear open the wrapping paper and the look on their face, who's giving and who's receiving at that moment, you know? So I think that, you know, some, one, some of the things we've heard is, A, the kind of a difference, a real life-changing difference scholarship can make, scholarships can make in their lives. It's, of course, remarkably rewarding. Uh, there's also the issue of continuation. Uh, uh, Joanna, Linda's daughter, is also a governor, and that's something that we see often in the Board of Governors. Uh, and there's a great deal of significance also even in a wider sense, Linda mentioned, uh, fighting brain drain. Uh, and, and this is one of the ways that we can keep the finest brains here uh, and not lose them to places that can offer them more financial support. So all of these things are very significant. Um, I actually think, how about, can, should we take a few questions? I think we have a few minutes for questions. What's that? We need a mic in the audience. Who would like to ask a question? Have we covered everything? You know every, okay, so just go ahead and donate in that case. <laughs> yes, please. Let's get a mic over to you. Unless you, unless you project very well. Thank you. Um, do you, uh, for example, target or not target specific high schools where you go and recruit potential scholarship uh, uh, students, or do they have to come to you? So there are uh, different programs that uh, do target uh, high school students, especially in the periphery, and they are brought to the university and shown around. And we do have particular scholarships that are targeted for a um, students coming from the periphery to the university. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Anyone else? Okay. In that case, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Drori. Thank you, Hudaya. Thank you, David. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Lihi. This has been wonderful and very informative. Thank you very much. And in direct uh, continuation of this wonderful panel, uh, no, no, please remain seated. <laughs> I would like to invite President Ariel Porat to inaugurate two major, huge new scholarship funds. President Porat. Could you hear me now? Could you hear me? Okay. So good afternoon. Maybe you could uh, do something with the light on my face, if possible. Okay, I'll change uh, position. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, it was very interesting to hear what you've said. We've seen you on video uh, a couple of Is hours ago. Is this Excuse me, just one okay, second. So, uh, so uh, what uh, we are going to do now is to celebrate uh, two generous uh, uh, donations that have been made to the university for a program that is very dear to me. This is the program for uh, distinguished students from the periphery of Israel. And uh, let me start with a piece of history. So when I was the dean of the law school of the faculty of law about well, actually more than 15 years ago, we observed that it's very rare to find among our students, uh, students coming from several uh, developing towns like uh, Dimona, Ofakim, and other uh, developing towns. And that was strange. So for Dim from Dimona, for example, at least for 20 years, there was no even a single student 
at the faculty of law. The faculty of law is and still is very competitive. It's not easy to get into it. And uh, that uh, bothered me and also bothered uh, some of my colleagues at the faculty of law. So then we came out with the idea uh, for this uh, new, pro then new program uh, addressing students from the periphery of Israel. And the idea was very simple. Instead of admitting students according to the traditional criterion, which is success in the psychometrical exams, which is similar to the SAT, to the SAT exams, instead of doing that, let's use a different and new criterion, which is the performance of pupils in their high schools relative to their peers. So for example, if in a certain high school in Dimona or Ofakim or Yerucham, there are say 300 students in, in a class and there is a group of uh, three or four or five students that excelled comparing to their peers, that was the idea of the program, they must be good enough for us as well. And uh, Right, they have probably unequal opportunities. Uh, my children studied in, a, you know, in the center of Israel. They uh, studied maybe in better high schools, so they are more prepared. That does not mean that they would succeed in university more than those who got uh, opportunities or uh, less, uh, less uh, privileged opportunities than what they got. So uh, we went to the Ministry of Education and uh, I remember that meeting with the Minister of Education and then with the Director General and later with some other people there. And what I say to them, give us a chance to try this new program. Why did we need the Ministry of Education? Because for us, the university, it's not easy to rank students in high school. Somebody should do it for us. Somebody should tell us who are in Ofakim or Dimona, the top five students, comparing them to their peers and say, these are the five uh, students. And it wasn't easy at the beginning to convince the Ministry of Education to make such an effort. You know, it's a huge effort. You know, you need to go to uh, at least 150 high schools in Israel, in the periphery, and a lot of work. And, you know, they asked themselves, why should you do it just for 10 students? Because we wanted to start with a pilot of 10 students only to the law school, to the faculty of law. So you need to convince them why to do it just for 10 students at the faculty of law. And what I say to them, I say to them, you see, if it works, then it would become a program for the entire university and later on maybe to other universities in Israel as well. And that could make a change, not only for the university or the universities that would have more diversified students, which itself is a virtue, but also because it would create kind of a hope and a, and something to look for when you are young, knowing that if you work hard enough, you don't need to compete with students in the, central, the center of Israel, but instead you need to be the best of your class. And if that works, you could go to the law school. You could go also for the medical school, which is number one in terms of competitiveness. This is the, still the school, which is the hardest one to get into it. So, I was lucky that there were some people, visionary people at the Ministry of Education that were convinced, and we went forward with the first uh, cohort of students. So we admitted 10 students. Those students could have, could, have, could have never been accepted, admitted to the law school by the regular criterion. Now, listen to this. After a year, seven out of the 10 completed the first year as distinguished students, like top 10% of their class. Oh. That seven out of 10 students, one of them that I remember very, very well, one of them was number three among 1,500 students in the law school, number three. Almost, uh, you know, there is the provost list. She was very close to being the provost list. There are only two in the provost list. She was number three. Number three out of 1,500 students and students that could have never accepted to the, admitted to the law school but for that program. So it was really very striking for us. Next year, we doubled, more than doubled, and we admitted 25 students. 
And a year later, it became a program for the university. I still remember the discussion I had with the dean of the medical school. He said to me, you see, you can't do it in the medical school. These are doctors. This is about people's life. We need to take really the best students. We could not make any compromises. And I say to him, you don't understand. You completely misunderstood the idea of the program. This is not an affirmative action problem, a, a program. It's not taking students who are you know, inferior in any respect to other students. It's just using a different criterion that in our view is more, is better predictive. Is, it, it, it better predicts the prospects of success in studying. And he was convinced and it also became a, a, it was a, became a, program, a program that was acceptable from the faculty of uh, medicine. So when I, uh, so I'm personally very proud in the, you know, I've done a lot of things when I was the dean of the law school, but when people ask me, tell us two things that you have done, I start with this program. There are some other things, but I start with this one because I'm really very proud of it. And um, then when I, I also, uh, you know, when I was the dean of the law school, I traveled to US, raised a few million dollars to, to provide those students with support because you cannot do it with no scholarships. With, you cannot bring a student from Dimona and say, okay, now you are here, you got admitted to the law school or to the faculty of medicine. Now you should take care of yourself. We don't help you because you would fail for sure. She would fail for sure. You must do it with general scholarships. Now, um, when I entered office three years ago as the president of the university, I checked what's, what happened with this program and uh, it, it was still going on, but not at the same intensity that I liked it to be. And I can tell you from the time I entered office, the program grew up by about 50% and I really believe that it should grow much, much more and everything depends on scholarships. Once we have the scholarships, we could do more. With no scholarships, it would be a failure and we don't want those students to be failed because they don't have the minimal conditions necessary to succeed in, uh, in, at the university. So this is about the program. Now, about the donations that we got from uh, very generous people. So let me start with a very dear friend of mine, uh, uh, Gary and Katy, Gary Ryan and Katy Fields Ryan. So Gary and Katy, both of them are devoted uh, friends of uh, the university and also very dear friends of mine, if I may say so. Um, I think uh, less than a year, about a half a year ago, during a gala in honor of uh, Anita F Friedman, I'm going to t say a few words about Anita in a minute, but in honor of Anita Friedman, both Katie and Gary surprised us by saying in the end of the gala, we donate one million dollars for, the, for this program of the distinguished students from the territory. <laughs> that was really very, very moving. But let me say you one more thing about uh, Gary and Katie. For them, this is a pattern of behavior. You know, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. You know, in law, there is such an, uh, about pattern of behavior. I don't know if you are familiar with that. So if a criminal, commits a crime in a certain <laughs> way and then does it again in a similar way, it could be an evidence that he committed the crime. So the pattern of behavior, even though what they did nothing to do with crime, but still with pattern of behavior, a year earlier, they've done exactly the same thing. And during a board of virtual board of governor meeting, at the end, they announced a donation of $1 million for our uh, COVID-19 campaign you might remember that there was a pandemic in the <laughs> world and, uh, and also uh, their donations went to the pandemic center that we uh, inaugurated uh, about two years ago. So they've done it twice. And in addition, they also donated in the past to the university. I don't know if then it was a kind of surprise or not, still a donation to mind you, mind you Kate, uh, scholarships at the Sagol School of Neuroscience, or these are really very dear and generous friends. And uh, now one, like a couple of sentences about uh, the person uh, to, the, to her honor that donation has been given, Anita Friedman. So Anita is such a special person. She's a leader. Uh, she's uh, inspirational for all of us. 
first of all, as to the Board of Governors and the University, she is the Vice Chair of the Board of uh, Governors, our Board of Governors. She is also uh, a Chair of our global campaign. She is uh, the head of the Coret Foundation, an extremely important foundation that supported the universities numerous times, always led by Anita. Anita is a leader in the United States, in the Jewish, and there is no, uh, you know, uh, the, you, it would be very hard to find a, a person, a definitely a Jewish guy, that wouldn't hear the name Anita Friedman. She's, uh, I, I would say, I don't want to insult anybody else, but uh, she's, in my view, the most prominent leader today in, uh, uh, you know, the Jewish community in the United States. She's uh, one, one, one of a kind. If you have uh, heard her uh, earlier in the morning, in the, when immediately after uh, my report about the state of the university, you might start understanding who Anita Friedman is. So, very good choice, Katie <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Gary. So, uh, I would like now to invite you, uh, Gary and Katie, and if possible also Anita, to receive a certificate to uh, uh, acknowledge and thank you about your generosity so for such a great cause, really a great cause. This is to witness that on the 11th day of May 2022, the Fields Ryan Scholarship Fund in honor of Dr. Anita Friedman was inaugurated in the presence of Drs. Gary Ryan and Katie Fields Ryan, both of them are doctors by the way, thereby providing the means for talented students from Israel's social and ge geographical periphery to gain a world-class higher education, redressing the under-representation of such students in Israeli universities and enabling them to inspire others from their home communities to follow in their footsteps, reinforcing the contribution of Tel Aviv University to educational equality and the bridging of social gaps across the nation, further demonstrating the deep commitment of the Fields Ryan family to higher education in Israel and honoring their dear friend and the university's esteemed global campaign chair, Dr. Anita Friedman. Ariel Porat and Mark Steif, the provost. <laughs> so, I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> what, a, what an honor and delight it is for us, uh, and humbling to be able to do this. So uh, thank you all, your wonderful panel, and, and your thoughts. And this really is like falling in love. Um, we don't usually do things on the spur of the moment. It's not our style, <laughs> but this was so compelling. And in fact, I remember the dinner you were at um, in Los Angeles. I had the fortune of sitting next to you and you described this. And it just made so much sense to us. We have as an avocation, uh, education and health. And so this was really a very easy thing for us to do. And, and further, I think um, the first lady, uh, Mary Herzog said it best yesterday. Education cannot just be for upper echelons. It has to be for everybody. And we, be, we believe very much in building from the ground up, and we really believe in supporting future generations. So thank you for the opportunity to do this. So you can see the impact when you take one life and you give them oxygen and you let them grow and all their potential is unleashed for themselves, for the people around them, and for the world, you change a life. So with that, why Anita Friedman? Why Anita? I'm gonna tell you a secret. <laughs> the secret must never leave this room. Okay, you ready? 
Anita, Dr. Anita Friedman has superpowers. <laughs> That's right. She does. That's right. You are under her influence as we speak. She is gold medal champion for the Jewish people here in Israel and across the world. She's extraordinary. She's also gold medal champion for mentoring. And we are her disciples. We'll follow her everywhere because there is no one like Anita. And the gift of this, this scholarship is because it is mentorship. It is leading, it is being that champion for those who cannot have one that makes the difference. You are the force multipliers in this room. What you do today becomes magnified. Who you bring with you today, who you impact because of your showing up and schlepping to this room will make that difference. So thank you for allowing us to have this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, my dear okay. friends. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have here uh, uh, Jeffrey Katz. <laughs> now Jeffrey, uh, I remember uh, meeting uh, Jeffrey, I think it was through Zoom, uh, when uh, Jeffrey got quite enthusiastic about uh, this program for students in the Israeli periphery. And uh, so, uh, Jeffrey Jeff is a, uh, is a chartered accountant in Montreal, Canada, and he is the head of a foundation which has been established from an estate of his client Sandra, uh, Sandra uh, uh, Dolansky. So uh, the name of the foundation that uh, uh, Jeffrey heads is the Charles Evelyn and Sandra Donalski Foundation. As I said, it was created from the estate of uh, uh, Jeffrey Katz's client, Miss Sandra Dolansky. And I want to read just uh, one sentence from the statement of mission of this foundation. And the statement says as follows. That's what should be done with the funds, right? To do mitzvot that will help to elevate the souls of Charles, Evelyn, and Sandra. So I think that uh, you could not find a better uh, goal that is so much consistent with this vision as to uh, take part in uh, our uh, program for uh, students in the uh, periphery of uh, Israel. Now, the same foundation also supported, similar to what you had done, also supported uh, our COVID-19 campaign, which is also scholarships for students, you know, the university done quite a lot, I don't know if you know, some of you know, to help uh, students during these uh, very uh, you know, uneasy or difficult times, and uh, part of it is due to this uh, foundation uh, generosity. So uh, may I call Jeffrey now to... Uh, written here in the certificate. This is to witness that on the 11th day of May 2022, the Charles Evelyn and Sandra Dolansky Periphery Scholarship Fund was inaugurated by Jeffrey Katz. I forgot to say this is another one million dollars. We got two million dollars for this very important program. More. Even more? Yeah. Well, here is six, a surprise six now. Six years. Six years? Two cohorts. Six years. 
I see. Okay. okay. So, so you see, so this I'm is sorry. these are no. On the contrary, these are the kind of, uh, the kind of I mean, mistakes that I, I exactly right sure. exactly. <laughs> you see, this is a, I wish we have a lot of mistakes as such, right? <laughs> that you think about exactly. X and then it's much. So it's thank 1. you so much. It's Five million. Wow! 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 <laughs> so I think that. that <laughs> How about that? Although I probably should fire someone for not informing me exactly what's going on here, still I'm very happy to hear the news, for me the news. Thank you so much. You know, this is a very warm person, of, uh, kind of a Jewish, uh, with a Jewish soul and generosity, and thank you so much for uh, being so helpful in uh, making this uh, uh, support uh, possible. So let me read now uh, uh, the rest of this. So, the Charles Evelyn and Sandra Dolansky Perofi Scholarship Fund was inaugurated by Jeffrey Katz, thereby substantially increasing Tel Aviv University's capacity to admit talented students to its flagship periphery program, enabling more young people from marginalized and disadvantaged backgrounds to benefit from the program's comprehensive support framework and gain a world-class higher education ensuring that students have every opportunity to thrive, successfully complete their degrees, and ultimately take on important roles throughout Israeli society, and reinforcing the university's commitment to expanding accessibility to higher education among all sectors of society. Ariel Porat, it's me, and Professor Mark Steif. Thank you very much. Five, it could be even better. So the, I wish there would be more mistakes yeah, like those. We'll try. Yeah. It depends on our return on investment this year. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe we're okay. You hear him. Yes. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here and for taking the time to listen to the amazing stories of these four students or three students and one professor, or however you want to look at it, and. What our program is going to do for all these unfortunate or marginalized group. And I have to say that it's not Jeffrey Katz. Jeffrey Katz is the CEO of this foundation, but I have a board, and I have a board that's very much Dr. Abraham Fuchs, I don't know if you know him, but he's the former dean of McGill Medicine yes, for a number of number of years. And it became um, a labor of love for our foundation to, and there was no better place to put the money to raise the neshuma of people that really, they were fine people, they were lovely, lovely people, but Everybody should have somebody to help them reach that, reach that ultimate goal. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we are uh, yeah, done that, uh, for today. Right? My mic on? Okay. Thank you, first of all. Uh, and thank you to our wonderful, general, uh, generous donors. Uh, can I add just one more thing about Anita? She has the best smile. And her default expression is a smile. I agree. Whenever you look at her, <laughs> she's smiling. Yeah. So that's another part of her magic. Um, I feel so privileged to have been able to take a part in this and really see the future uh, come to life. Thank you all so much for being here. And uh, uh, you've earned your lunch. So please, uh, lunch is going to be served actually in that area. So don't exit through those doors, exit through these doors. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm.